One of the big plays that people are talking about in 2023 is the recovery in China. We've already heard from the government that they want now to open up after that COVID squeeze where we saw the zero COVID policy take growth right down to levels not seen in almost five decades. So how does the economy regroup? And as traders, how can we take advantage of an opportunity like this? Let's turn to Ron William. And first of all, say Happy New Year. Thanks indeed for joining us. It's great to see you in the studio again. Thank you. Good to be back in 2023. So now you at RW Advisory have put together a whole bunch of slides talking about this reawakening of, of China. How do you view the opportunity broadly, first of all, before we get into the charts? So it's an uneven uh, recovery that we're likely to see in the first half and then uh, longer uh, and more a stable uh, second half and beyond. Uh, we begin by looking at the vital signs of the reopening, just, just to see how the evidence-based data um, uh, unravels. And you can see here on the opening chart, uh, the reality is infection waves have peaked in tier one uh, cities, looking at Beijing, Shanghai and Shenzhen. Uh, that was late December. Of course, there, there are likely going to be short-term challenges uh, as that uh, situation uh, recovers, and that's been the case uh, the world over. Uh, but the good sign is uh, immediate uh, rebound in high-frequency measures like mobility uh, um, data, so the number of passengers uh, in the metro, which is one, one of the uh, transparent things that we can look at. Uh, and you can see there just it being uh, uh, in an uptick uh, situation uh, over the last month or so. Uh, all of this along with, so the reopening along with stimulus and, and policy uh, driven stimulus, it's, it's already in the headline uh, speeches, uh, it is uh, pro-growth and proxy assets. So you can see there the chart at the bottom, figure three, uh, just showing how uh, both China, uh, MSCI and the resource play of copper being the biggest buyer of, of copper, are both up since November. What's interesting is the black line, uh, which is uh, China stimulus, uh, bottomed in early last year, 2022, uh, where there was you know, a shift uh, in, into the easing uh, policy, and yet that wasn't strong enough to, to, to shift the market uh, into recovery uh, point until uh, the reopening actually happened. So having both together, um, is a positive for the short term. Let's look in some more detail about some of the asset classes that we're looking at here. I'm interested, to, you mentioned copper, uh, but there's a lot of asset classes that could contribute to this uh, rebound or benefit from a rebound in China. But also take a look as well at what's happening with China offshore and onshore because there's a different market there as well, isn't there? Yes, I think, I think the global picture is, is more polarised, uh, where different experts are, are citing you know, plausible scenarios uh, for uh, a, a strong recovery that could impact the world uh, or a more luck, lackluster one that, that might not. I think it's good to, to play out each scenario, even the ones that we least expect, so at least that way we're prepared. Mm. Um, and also, last year, if, there, if ever there was one lesson, it was be prepared for the unexpected. <laughs> okay. uh, but unexpected doesn't just mean negative surprise, it can mean positive, which is one of the reasons why I'm, I'm grateful that we're having this discussion, because we're actually looking at the other side of the, uh, yeah. uh, of the investment, uh, uh, you know, projections and, and opportunities. So we can see here the best way to look at the best and least uh, best uh, opportunities is by looking at a model-driven approach. Uh, this is what I look at on a regular basis at RW Advisory. It's a global ranking model looking at uh, trends uh, across strategic long-term, tactical medium-term and active short-term. And you can see right at the top there is uh, the resource play led by copper not oil, I might add. Oil is right at the bottom, uh, so it, it has had an oversold rally. Everyone can see that on their on their trading screens, but it is still pressured by the uh, long-term to medium-term trend forces, um, and and it didn't really kind of push up uh, post geopolitical risk from last year. So we we do need to see further uh, directionality to the upside on oil um, for that to play out. But for now, copper is definitely strong, top. Uh, also fueled by the macro reopening play of China. You can see China there in gr uh, light green, um, ebbing up higher, uh, recovering from that oversold condition, nearing 
uh, the benchmark world performance. You can see their world in purple. Uh, we're, we're neck to neck and, and likely to outperform in due course. So a reason to certainly be neutral China and maybe overweight China over the long term to strategic, um, depending on, on everyone's uh, perspective on, on the market. Now, if we look at the actual hard and fast performance, the charts on the right, paint the picture, and you can see top right figure two, MSCI China outperforms S&P 500 by just uh, around 20%. Now, if we think about that for a moment, uh, this is really where fire meets ice. So we, we have this, this upside surprise story uh, from China, which you know, may continue uh, soft or, or, or strong, uh, but the key thing is it's there. Uh, while the rest of the world is talking about a slowdown and recessionary uh, forces looming, it, it is an interesting juxtapose, and, and I think it's important for us to at least differentiate between the two for now, um, and the fact that there's a plus 20% differential. If we look at the bottom uh, chart, figure three, it shows more of the same, uh, but for the same region. Uh, China uh, up is positive for EM equities, and probably a, a a better way to play the China story through the regional uh, trading partners uh, amid the high correlation, but also potential high beta plays where we can get a better risk reward uh, for, for this type of theme. Mm. Let, let's pick up on this point now as well about the onshore and offshore and ask how steady the recovery is and how you gauge that. Yes, so the actual uh, broadness of the recovery and the, and the pace are the, are the two things I think where, where there's most debate. Um, and what the charts uh, show us is that it is a, an uneven uh, recovery. Uh, if we look at, exactly as you said, onshore versus offshore. Now, what do we mean by that? If we look at the uh, well-known and popular proxy CSI 300, uh, which is the uh, relatively new uh, broad index uh, on China, which looks at a mixture of uh, industrial stocks found in the Shanghai Composite and uh, the tech-driven ones in, in the Shenzhen um, index. So if you, uh, if you diversify your risk, but also look for the best of both worlds, uh, you get the chart there on the left, um, which, yes, is down over the long-term uh, trend, but it's unwinding from oversold conditions, which is the main story here, as part of that reopening story, and has just broken its uh, falling uh, strategic 200-day moving average. Now, that's an early bullish signal, but not uh, the be-all end-all. We do need further uh, sustainable follow-through. Uh, right now, we're, we're not entirely overbought. It could still extend further, but we're not far from a three-stand deviation uh, extreme, which in history, you can see there on the bottom chart uh, on the volatility indicator, um, has led to a healthy um, unwind. So perhaps we get uh, two steps forward, one step back, and we have a little bit of a zigzag uh, trajectory in this recovery from oversold conditions. That's onshore. And onshore, from a macro and geopolitical perspective, is supported by uh, leadership policy. Uh, now, I, I say that because we're all aware of the headlines that some of these uh, China-based stocks uh, are under pressure, certainly internationally and in, in the U.S. exchanges, as a case in point, of being delisted. Um, so an average day investor or even trader needs to be factoring this in. Uh, we don't see it on the chart uh, per, per se, but, but, but we, kn we know it's there, that, that risk factor. Interestingly, the chart seems to be pricing in some type of structural risk, uh, because if you look on the right, figure two and three, uh, starting with figure two, offshore China at a cliff edge, basically. This multi-year trend which has been up, but it's broken down. We're now retesting uh, the, the top side of that uh, trend line. If we break above that, that's positive for China overall and suggest a uh, more viable and sustainable recovery. If not, this would be an additional headwind uh, to consider. And then if we strip out tech, which has been great for everyone globally as part of a mega cap growth uh, theme for, for, for the last few years, that generally has been unwinding, but China has outperformed, uh, certainly if we look at the FANG uh, stocks uh, as a case important, and th th that's probably not a big surprise now that FANG has dropped so much uh, and been defanged, but still, uh, earlier on, China was outperforming in terms of China tech. Now, if you take that juice out of the, uh, the chart, uh, you're left with figure three, which shows a sideways consolidation break down, which is also at a make or break retest level. So again, if either one of these charts uh, push back up, that will be 
uh, more positive for a broad China bull story. If it doesn't, uh, then it'll be an offshore uh, headwind that people need to keep in mind, and, and that geopolitical macro risk in terms of the international uh, tensions and, and just changing uh, polarization that's been taking place over the last year or two. Well, let's, let's dig deeper on some of the technicals and ask you more about how we go about trading this. And in the context of your next chart, uh, which uh, brings us into uh, the currency markets. Yes, so uh, hard and fast technicals are actually led. Uh, if you look at the, uh, I mean, the, the stock market play, uh, which featured on our model early on uh, before the, the COVID reopening and then more so thereafter, along with the resource proxy of copper. Uh, this chart shows uh, the currency, so dollar, uh, China, renminbi, uh, reversing against the dollar. So when this chart goes down, it's renminbi outperforming the dollar. Uh, chart on the uh, left, big, big chart, figure one. Uh, that naturally chimed in round right about the time that the dollar topped in terms of the, the DXY broad index, along with the uh, interim unwind in uh, interest rates, uh, particularly out of the US. Uh, so, so that was the international macro story as to why other currencies outperformed. Uh, but China in particular, and on this chart, technically it had a, a demarc exhaustion uh, signal um, early on, uh, then a, a distribution top phase, which was later confirmed below 710, suggesting that we were going to break down below the seven psychological handle into the 200-day moving average as part of a overdue mean reversion move. Remember, this is China and NIMBY outperforming the dollar when, when the chart goes down. Uh, we're currently trading there, so this chart is uh, showing the, the analysis at the time of the analysis, uh, and we've, we're now trading below that 200-day. Uh, we're trading around technical fair value, uh, which is around 660, uh, with risk to 667, if you want to be more precise, as to uh, a potential overshoot situation. The cycles uh, suggesting further uh, um, uptrend or, or in, in Renimbi. Uh, or, or down in this chart versus the dollar, uh, but uh, that could come under some uh, macro headwinds, of course, based on how China leadership actually uh, managed their interest rate differential um, and their balance of payment uh, situation. Of course, that will influence their own currency, uh, and technically we could get an unwind during that time. But for now, the technicals did prove out early on. Um, and they're saying that most of this move, China and NIMBY outperformance, um, has been played out. What about the two, figure two and figure three, and how do you read that in the context of where we are? Yes, so it, it suggests f f f further Renimbi outperformance uh, in the short term, uh, both in, in time uh, cycle, uh, that's the top chart that we see there uh, based on the foundation study of cycles, uh, their mathematical model for measuring cycles uh, on this currency, which I use across uh, global cross-asset markets. Uh, the bottom right-hand chart is a historical chart just showing the massive uh, pendulum oscillations um, on, on the currency and that the, 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 the equilibrium area um, is around 667 or let's say 670 if you want to round up. Uh, or even round down to 660, mm -hmm. uh, above or below you know, that area um, is the, the long-term historical uh, fair value area based on the technical chart. Mm. Just wanted to quickly pick up, I don't want to go into too much for the fundamental side of things, but the, the chart you showed us with the US dollar against the UN, the offshore, remember this is actually, isn't it? Um, to what degree is that dollar weakness because we've been following a dollar weakness story. In fact, you and I have spoken about this yeah. in other interviews. Um, when you have a currency market trade, of course, there's always strength in one, weakness in the other. We're talking about strength in the Chinese currency against that dollar weakness. How confident are you that this is a China story and not a dollar story? Great question, and, and I get asked this regularly by clients and, and uh, industry colleagues. It, it's both, mm -hmm. uh, and it tends to be a mixture uh, particularly when, when you, you get a, a, a triangulation mm. um, of factors uh, between macro, fundamental and technicals. Now, technicals is what leads me in terms of the chart read and, and the behavioral action. Uh, ultimately, it, it chimed in with the dollar top and the uh, unwind in rates. That was the timing. Uh, but that only gave us the indication, early indication, that the dollar top was in, um, softer inflation uh, print and, and let's say a slowdown in central bank uh, rate hikes 
was happening. It didn't tell us which currencies were going to outperform the most yeah. uh, or how that was going to impact you know, various opportunities around the world. Uh, China certainly did outperform uh, by, by a significant amount in comparison to other currencies. Uh, we also did see it on the, on the uh, G10 fronts in terms of certainly the G3, uh, Euro, uh, Pound, the yen, yen is, is maybe further amplified by the uh, macro policy of, of yield control uh, and how that has played out. Uh, but generally speaking, different currencies played out differently against the dollar. More recently, the dollar index did uh, trigger a new low breakout. So that is further down for the dollar. Um, that hasn't actually yet shown up on this, uh, this currency uh, trade yet, partly because of, of China-specific mm. uh, events that are taking place. So it, it's never a, 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 a one-way move yeah. um, or a binary correlation. Th things do ebb and flow in different ways in different markets. Mm. Let's move uh, back to copper, because this is one of the big stories. Within this China story, there's a lot of pent-up demand we're hearing. Um, potentially uh, for, for, for this. And in fact, my understanding is, talking to copper traders, that they're expecting copper to go into deficit. I think this is the idea that we're going to get uh, uh, not enough supply um, with this deluge of demand we're expected to get. Um, explain more about the copper charts and, and where you think copper, how you think copper will benefit. So the price chart shows the behavioural connection between demand and supply forces. And of course, this is going to, this is going to be the debate that goes on for, for most of this year in terms of uh, how a China reopening will, will impact either side of that equation. Focusing on, 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 the, on the technicals, this shows that it was likely a buy on the rumour, sell, sell after the fact uh, reaction, uh, where copper did surge into the uh, China reopening uh, headline event from late uh, last year, December, into uh, early this year, Jan, uh, going into the Chinese New Year. Uh, but uh, it is currently overbought. You can see that uh, DeMarc exhaustion signal, the same one I shared with you mm -hmm. um, on the dollar uh, China renminbi chart, um, at a key uh, interim resistance zone at 430. So price meets uh, momentum exhaustion. Um, and then you can also see there the volatility measure at the bottom uh, showing a three standard deviation historical extreme, which more than likely means that, that we need a welcome respite um, in the short term. So a, a good trade uh, before, during, and a little bit after the headline story came out, but likely um, uh, kind of uh, pausing for now. Uh, what's interesting is if you combine that with the uh, cycle trajectory on, on the top right, figure two, it shows that we could have a, a little bit further upside uh, momentum, but it's a two-stage pattern, short-term up and a medium-term down. Uh, this is not going to give directionality uh, calls, but it, it does give uh, a further overlay in terms of the timing pattern. Um, and then just la lastly, the, the big picture, we need to take a step back and look at the, the big picture chart. It shows historical peak zones on copper, uh, which many of the traders I'm sure will be watching in terms of uh, you know, key pivot points. And you can see there right at the top, multi-year peak at between 50, 450 and 440. It really matters, of course, which contract you're looking at. So this is HG1, uh, looking mm -hmm. at the continuous uh, historical contract of copper. Uh, you can translate that to your own uh, proxies accordingly. Uh, so that is overhead multi-year resistance that we still have ahead, even if copper were to, to rally up higher. Um, so this would need to be a commodity bull uh, trend fueled by China and may maybe economic recovery uh, in other parts of the world, or, or maybe just inflation, or, or a mixture of the two. But th the trend needs to continue higher into that zone. Um, and if not, there's the support zone between 320 and 350, uh, just, just below, if we have that healthy uh, unwind from overbought conditions. The additional point I'd like to make is uh, you're talking about uh, demand supply uh, Imbalance. imbalances. Uh, the positioning is also very uh, interesting because right now there's a build-up in copper positioning. The biggest buyer is China. Um, so I think th that is, is, is a positive for copper up uh, over the uh, medium to long term. It needs to stay strong 
Um, and of course, if this China recovery remains uh, stable and, and, and sustainable, uh, then we're likely to see it in resource plays like copper, less so energy just because it's coming from a lower base uh, and has further uh, headwind pressures. Uh, the chart isn't bullish yet uh, on, a, on a medium to long term basis, but certainly copper has been playing out. There are ETF plays on both China onshore, offshore, um, and resources like copper, uh, and perhaps other currencies uh, that, that could be used as a proxy for this uh, story. Ron, we'll have to leave it there, but thanks indeed for joining us with this look at the China reawakening story. That's Ron William from RW Advisory, and as Ron was saying, you can trade this through a number of China directed ETFs on our investment platform and indeed on CFDs. So you can pick your choice in terms of how you play this in terms of copper or any other of the commodity plays or indeed the Chinese Yuan.